There are times we get caught up in this mindset that there's really only one way to lead and there's only one right way to lead or one best way to lead. But the truth is there, are, you know, there's more than one road that leads to effective leadership. There are many different paths that can take us to effective leadership and people approach it from all different kinds of ways. So, uh, but we have over time kind of, uh, you know, tended to focus on one or the other. So I want to take a look at, at how this discussion of leadership has developed over time in the field of, of communication and, and in, in general in, in organizational communication in, in particular, and look at some of the historical approaches to leadership, kind of the, the path that has led us to these different uh, examinations of leadership. So um, first of all, discussion of leadership and specific leadership skills really started with, with the, what we call the trait approach, the idea that great leaders are born. And that was a, historically the, one of the first examinations of leadership was that, you know, some people are just born great leaders. Some people are just born to lead, right? And so they look at the different traits. They try to examine the different traits that were involved in leadership. So you, you had things like um, like drive and leadership motivation and honesty, integrity, charisma, all these types of things that you can see here that that people said, well, these are these are what make a great leader. And some people are born with these abilities and others are not. So either you have it or you don't kind of thing. You're either born with it or you're not. And uh, so um, that but but we know that really that was kind of a limiting thing, right? We know that the, some people are born with these things. Some people are not. And we can look at leaders and say, well, but that leader doesn't have all of these things. So we know that there that there's something beyond just trait leadership. But that was the initial approach that led us to this discussion of what is leadership and what makes a good leader and and how should we approach this so so we've kind of set the lead, the uh, trait leadership aside in some ways although we recognize that leaders will have certain traits you know undeniably but that doesn't mean they're born with them they can be they can be taught they can be learned they can be developed over time and so it's not something that you're either born with or not necessarily As some people have a head start maybe but anyway it's not it's not just all about being born a great leader right so then we kind of started looking at leadership from a behavioral aspect, thinking, you know, well, leaders are what they do. A leader is what a leader does. And so what do leaders do then? And so the behavioral, behavior, behavioral approach, really like, like all great things, started as a battle between the University of Michigan and uh, that school down south, right, Ohio State University. Where there were competing um, schools of thought in, in between researchers at Michigan and, and at Ohio State uh, about leadership, and they were kind of going at it at the same time. Uh, and inevitably, as, as is proper, Michigan won out uh, in a pair of researchers named Robert Blake and Jane Mooton um, in 1964 published work on a, a behavioral ap approach to leadership that really led the way for a long time. They developed what they called the leadership grid. So let's just take a look at that. The leadership grid basically starts with, you know, it's this axis of a concern for production and then a concern for people. So they said, we got to be, you know, some have some concern for, for what we're producing and task orientation, but also the relational orientation and the concern for people. And so you could have uh, people on the hot leaders on the high and low end of, of each of those things. And depending on where they fell, in these things, they would fall in kind of one of these categories, right? Either indifferent when they were didn't care about production or people, they were known as indifferent. Right? If they were only cared about production and not people, then they were known as controlling. That's what we would call controlling if they fell in that part of the grid. If they fell in uh, the high concern for people but low concern for production, they were accommodating. And if they were high in both, then that was sound leadership. Um, and then in the middle, they, they developed what they called status quo, balance and compromise. So they were kind of equally concerned with both um, concern with people and concern for production and, and kind of in the middle on both those things, balancing it all out. So, but this is the basic leadership grid that they came up with, right? The, the leadership grid. And so um, then uh, we've updated the, that terminology slightly. And now it's, it, it typically carries these kind of terms. But, but we basically said, well, leaders are a leader is what a leader does. So if they if they are a high um, concern for people and low concern for production, then they would be a country club leader or they could be a team leader. They could be middle of the road or whatever it is. And that's how we would identify leaders is by what they do and how they express concern for both people and production, right? which kind of somewhere, you know, that's, there's, there's some value to that. And we still use that at times. So people look at the behavior. And so that's one aspect of leadership. But over time, we developed yet another approach as these thoughts and, and uh, areas of study continue to evolve and develop um, we came with the uh, situational approach, which is kind of said, well, it depends, you know, what makes a good leader? Well, it really depends on 
the situation depends on the context depends on the person it just depends on what's needed in that moment really so the situational approach really was was developed and championed by paul hersey and and ken blanchard and really um published in the, and came into popularity in the early 2000s and 2001 is when they first published their research and started a real examination of this and they also said that there's really uh, there's there's a, you know a scale between relationship and task behavior so similar to the 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 leadership grid uh, developed by Blake and Mooton they were they were on that same kind of track and said basically okay yeah we still have task behavior and a relationship behavior and we're high and low on that but what is needed in you know in that moment depends on where the group is at and where where the the individual is at and where the leader is at what will leadership style is needed and so they also said there are four four parts of this grid essentially and so then they developed accordingly four leadership styles and so if we go back to our grid we've got the four areas um again high in task and low in relationship is what we call telling um there's also selling then which is high in both high in relationship and low in task is participating and delegating then it's the other type of of leadership style so you have again depending on whether that is high on uh, relationship or high on on task and and then um, the the leader though must match the style to the readiness of the individual and the readiness of the group okay so the leader then in this uh, situational perspective has to match up meaning they have to determine and decide what is going to be appropriate in that in that moment so we see that you know uh early on really in the, in the first stage s1 here we see that th there's going to be a lot of telling there's going to be a lot of concern with task behavior and very little in relationship you don't really care about people's feelings when you're trying to teach them what to do and try and get them on the right track right then once we get that going a little bit we can move into that selling aspect okay and s2 there we move into s2 where we have both concern for the the task and also the the relationship or the person uh, on the other end of that right as we get more comfortable we're selling them on what we're doing and and uh, and selling them on what the team is trying to accomplish and what what their role is and all that then we get into s3 after we've been in it for a while the the, the manager and the leader really has to shift them into then into a what we call participating style of leadership right where they're kind of pitching in and 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 everybody's everybody's uh it's a more participative style everybody's involved in discussion and and uh, involved in the process then it's not so much a, a authoritative approach as a participative approach and then eventually though the leader ideally will be able to get into delegating where they're just really kind of giving out tasks and letting people go letting them run with it right so that's where you're at ideally then in that situation okay. so again the the situational perspective says that the the leader has to match what is needed with where that the, the readiness of that person or that that group what it, what is what is necessary at that time now we do need to note that the situational perspective is influenced by outside forces right it's influenced by timelines and economics and and uh, and leadership outside of that uh, group and and that 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 particular relationship so there's all kinds of things that influence that that situational perspective now we moved ahead then involve and continuing to evolve our our ideas on leadership into what we call the transformational approach and moving beyond the situational and into the transformational where we talk about let's shake things up transformational leaders are all about changing the status quo and shaking things up so the transformational approach and transformational leadership the goal here the idea is to instill a vision is to is to cast that vision for for everybody in the organization everybody in the group um, that and that they catch on that so your job as a leader is to instill a vision and then it's to demonstrate passion for what it is you're doing the, the transformational approach does not work if the person who's leading is not passionate about that and that they don't demonstrate and show that passion right? they have to both demonstrate then and also receive from their 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 team a commitment to the mission everybody's got to be rowing in the same direction but he's got to be pulling in the same direction but he's got to be on the same page and have a desire to move forward and to accomplish what it is they're working toward right now the the um, one kind of catch with the transformational approach is that success can be tied to an individual. Can, success can be tied to that leader. You can kind of create sort of a cult of personality, right? Where people are not just committed to the mission and have a have a passion for that, but they also become committed to that person. So if you have a change in leadership, then it can be an issue. It's hard to sustain that transformational approach when you lose a leader, and if you don't have somebody else step in who's also an equally effective 
transformational leader. That can be really, really challenging. So um, we see that, for example, in the case with GE. Jack Walsh, who was the chief executive officer of GE from 1981 to 2001. All right, so 20 years he um, worked with GE and ran GE. Um, really shook things up when he came in. He had a really uh, a different attitude toward leadership and toward what the organization was doing. He really flattened the corporate hierarchy. For example, at GE was a huge organization, lots of hierarchy, lots of levels. And he said, nope, we're flattening all that. We're going to get rid of some of these middle areas and just, you know, flatten things, flatten that hierarchy out. He really lessened the formality of the workplace and made it not such a stuffy place, not so much a suit and tie type place, but lessen the formality of it, called people by first names and, and that kind of thing as well. He embedded succession planning and employee development into the GE kind of um, ethos, right? That wasn't something that was done before, but he said, you ought to be training your replacement, essentially. We ought to be thinking about what's that next uh, generation going to look like so we can have this continuation of how can we develop our employees. So that was another thing he brought with him. He was also really aggressive in demand and in, in, in uh, and, and had a, a really aggressive demand for performance, right? So his motto was fix it, close it, or sell it. Whatever the division, whatever the product, whatever the, the project was going on in GE, you either, your, your goal was either, your, your mandate was either to fix it, close it, or sell it if possible. They weren't going to spend a lot of time doing all this. They were either going to be able to, to get things right and get them on track, or it was going to be shut down or sold off. Right? He also had this, this philosophy where he fired like the bottom 10% of, of, uh, uh, of his managers, bottom 10% by whatever performance metric. They were fired no matter what. Even if that performance metric was awesome, if they were in the bottom 10% or whatever, they got fired. Uh, and so he had really aggressive in, in his performance standards and, and in demanding performance from people. Uh, and, and it worked really well until he left. Right? And GE had this amazing turnaround, this amazing, amazing resurgence in the organization during the time that he was there. But by the, after he left, within just a few years, it had all fallen apart because it really did depend on his leadership specifically. And he didn't do a very good job of, of, uh, of having that succession planning and having somebody who could continue to carry that torch after he left. And it all just kind of fell apart. So transformative leadership can be amazing. It can work wonders. But you really have to think hard about, is it, you know, make sure it's not tied to that person or it's only going to work as long as that person is there. Okay. More recently, we've seen a visionary approach um, to leadership as well. It's, it's, this is something that's really fueled by the leader's dreams of what could be. All right. So specifically, we look at, at somebody like Steve Jobs at Apple and the, the way he led Apple. And, and just this idea of, you know, he walked in and said, look, I don't like the way a computer looks. This is how it should look went to his, his engineers and said, this is how it should look. Now make a computer that looks like that and works like this and does this. And they would say, but that's, that's not possible. It's never been done. And he would say, well, that's what we're doing. You know? So he, he, he'd say, this is what, what could be, what should be, what I want to happen and expect people to get there. And he got it out of them. He, you know, it's not something that will work for everybody, but, but you know, some, sometimes that visionary approach can be effective as well. It's sort of the, an offshoot of the transformative uh, approach is whatever kind of specific type of transformative leadership. So, so as we've seen here, really, again, a reminder that there's not just one road to leadership. There are many, many ways that we can get to leadership, many paths that take us to kind of the same area. It's just a matter of what's the best kind of leadership for you and for your situation and for your organization. And, and, and we've seen these things evolve over time and will continue to evolve over the time, the type of leadership um, that is necessary. So we need to remember that we've got these historical approaches that we've examined, but we don't know what's next, you know, and that could, that's still coming up down the pike here. Okay. So if you have questions about the historical approaches to leadership, any of these types of approaches to leadership or anything uh, related to those, please feel free to email me and let me know. I'd, I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope this has been enlightening for you as we've examined the different types of, uh, of, of categories of leadership that we've seen over time and, and some of the ways that those have been effective and not so effective. And as we continue to examine uh, leadership of small groups and organizations.